Hello and welcome to Design Timber. My name is Tabitha Blinding and I'm Head of Education and Engagement for the Timber Development UK. This is a new series from Timber Development UK where we are creating the opportunity to learn directly from the architects and the multidisciplinary teams behind four incredible projects. These projects have been selected from the winners of the Wood Awards 2021. And I'm really excited to launch into this new series. But firstly, a bit of information. So as people come into the room, I would like to tell you a bit about Timber Development UK. Timber Development UK has been formed from the merger of the Timber Trade Federation and TRADA. This is ongoing and a really exciting project which we hope to fully realise by the end of the summer. By bringing these two associations together as one, we have created the largest and most comprehensive supply chain body in the UK, spanning from sawmill to specifier to finished project and all points in between. Our mission is for timber to be accepted as the first choice for any suitable construction project in the UK and as the best route to decarbonise the built environment. To do this, we will act as an agent of change towards more sustainable, low carbon forms of construction. At the centre of our mission are three main interlinking goals. We are setting out to connect the supply chain through this merger, to lead best practice by building the largest, most comprehensive online library of technical specification and design guidance, and to accelerate a low carbon future as we support the timber supply chain to lead as a net zero industry. Events like today are crucial to these goals and our mission. Today, we kick off the Design Timber Series with Maudlin College Library, which won the gold in the Wood Awards 2021. Designed by architects Niall McLaughlin and engineer Smith and Woolwork, the Maudlin College Library has been described as a tour de force of architectural design and achievement. In the first half of today's session, we will hear from the design team as they go into detail on the concept and process behind the Magdalen College Library. Then we will move into a panel discussion and finally, we'll have a question and answers. So if you do have any questions you would like to be answered by the group, please do put them into the, the Q&A behind the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome our speakers, Tim Allen Booth, architect, Associate Architect at Niall McLaughlin Architects Limited, Simon Smith, Structural Engineer and Co-Founder of Smith & Woolwork, Hannes Voss, Project Manager of Urban Limited with Specialized Timber Engineers and Subcontractors, and Fernando Perez, the senior engineer at Smith and Woolwork. Um, Tim, can I ask you to share your screen, please? Thank you, Tabitha. Hope you can all see that now. So um, well, thank you, Tabitha, for the introduction and thank you to Timber Development UK for inviting us to talk today about uh, our project for Magdalen College. Um, just to give you a brief overview, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the design of the building as uh, an architectural conception and just give you a bit of background on how we came to the solution we did and describe what it is, show you how it's laid out and so on. Uh, and I'll hand over to Simon, who's going to talk a bit about the structural engineering aspects of the design and then he'll hand over to Hannes, who's going to talk a bit about how they delivered the engineered timber components of the scheme. I think that probably gives a slightly false impression, perhaps, that, uh, that, that it wasn't as collaborative as it was. You know, that we sort of handed this over to the engineers and they solved all the problems. I think it's been one of those projects where we had a very rich collaboration with the whole team throughout. And I think that's been part of what's been able to make it successful. Um, so I'll just begin by uh, talking briefly about um, our interest as a practice in, in the design of timber buildings. Um, this project on the screen is the uh, cafe we built on Deal Pier, 300 metres out into the English Channel, um, uh, over a decade ago now. Uh, it's a fully hardwood, mostly prefabricated construction, and it was my first project um, in the practice. 
Um, and then this is our first engineered timber construction, uh, which is the uh, interior timber frame at Ripon Chapel uh, in uh, Oxfordshire. And um, the, the timber frame holds up the roof within, within a masonry wall enclosure. So a couple of projects that I've been quite involved in. And those, I think, so that ongoing research within the practice into making timber buildings has helped inform the work we did for Magdalen College. So this is the site as we found it in 2014 when we were asked by the college to take part in a competition, which we eventually won, to design their new library and archive facilities, but also a gallery space within the building. Uh, and the build, new building was to replace a very cramped and um, uh, poorly equipped library, which sits in, in the building you see on the left of that slide, uh, which is the Peeps Library, which is in fact a grade one listed building. Um, and this is the backside of that library and it faces into what they call, the college calls the Fellows Garden, uh, which is an open landscape space with mature trees along, along the edges of it. So just to give you a brief overview of the, the college's site, uh, the Magdalene's uh, origins were as a, a monastic uh, educational settlement, as many of the colleges. It was actually built outside of the town on the other side of the riverbank, supposedly to keep the monks uh, away from the temptations of the town. And the college developed around uh, a first court, which you see in this image, um, in, this, in this site plan, which runs off Magdalene Street and closed on four sides containing um, on, on its west side, it's, it's dining hall, and on its north side, it's chapel, and originally a, a very small library space. And then in the, in the late 17th century, they developed a second court, uh, which terminated in, um, in the Pepys building, which you saw the back of, um, which contains the library of Samuel Pepys on an upper story, and originally contained their, their undergraduate library. And so our new library, which you see towards the top of the page, continues the uh, uh, arrangements of quadrangular uh, courts, the buildings around them, but out, but developing that into this into the fellows garden. And so the library faces two gardens: it faces the fellows garden um, on the east and the master's garden on the west. And the master's garden is a private garden, so we've had a quite a complex process of negotiating how much we look into it. So this few a couple of images of the route to the library through the college, you come in a gate off Magdalen Street, you enter a, a, a courtyard, which is medieval in its, or, in its building origins and uh, is a substantially brick uh, enclosure um, containing a, the, the, the dining hall ahead of us. And the, the brickwork has a, a wonderful texture, which has been repaired extensively over the years with these stone tracery uh, openings within it. And then the final image there is of the Peeps building, uh, the, the neoclassical frontage onto Second Court, and it has a very different backside to which you saw in the previous slide. So, in thinking about this project and in approaching the competition, um, we uh, we were thinking about the monastic origins of the of the of the site, and we were also thinking about the brief we've been given from the college, which was for a building in which which placed the scholar at the centre of 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 of, the, of their own little world. And in particular, they were interested in the idea that the building would allow students to feel amongst books and to create a kind of a sense of studiousness within the building. We, we showed them this, this painting by Antonello de Messina, uh, which shows St. Jerome in his study and uh, sort of imagining of his study. And it's a wonderful uh, composition where he sits on this kind of raised timber dais in his little uh, uh, it's per perfectly kind of made desk space with his books around him with sat within this masonry frame and as you look into the depths of the painting you can see a kind of prospect beyond of some sort of Arcadian landscape and so we had this was a sort of um, touchstone for the design of the building and so the building we've created we try it one of the main things we've done with this is to try to create this sense of a kind of masonry frame where the timber construction of furniture, of structure, of linings, of joinery and so on is all kind of interwoven with the structure of the building as a kind of three-dimensional lattice into which readers can position themselves in a, in a sort of variety of, of ways so that, so that students have a variety of ways of inhabiting the space and a, um, from open plan spaces like the one you see here to tucked away niches where they can hide away. 
So we began the design with a sort of a single room, a single reading room, which accommodates a desk of about six for, for six people, um, bookshelves around uh, the walls and a space to move around within the room. And this is a kind of basic module. And um, this, this module is 4.7 meters uh, in both directions. Um, and we needed to provide a hundred book spaces. So we needed quite a few of these uh, rooms, 15, 16 of this size of, of space potentially. And so we began to think about how we might arrange this kind of module in, in, in a sensible way, um, but also one which would create variety and interest. And we looked at these uh, two projects by the American architect, Louis Kahn. The one on the left is the Richards Medical Center, uh, which is a laboratory building. And on the right is the Trenton Bathhouse project. We're two different, very different scales of project, but what's interesting for us is the way in which a kind of larger module exists in the plan and a second smaller module also exists, which gives a kind of rhythm to the organization of the plan. And we also looked at this project, which is a section through uh, the, ha the, the house of John Soane in Lincoln's Inn Fields. And we love the way that this project produces an immense spatial richness through the modulation of larger and smaller spaces and the larger rooms with their lant lantern roof lights are separated by interstitial kind of passageways and circulation spaces uh, that creates this, this com spatial complexity and richness. So at the top of our uh, building, we decided we would have roof lanterns a bit like the own building and we made them with these folded plain pitched roofs and then glazed each of the four uh, triangular gables uh, and, and made that kind of the, the, the basic module of our building so you get a top lit reading room and that enables you as in many libraries to have floor to ceiling shelving where you need it and then between the rooms we've arranged all the circulation so this is one of the main accommodation stairs so it allows you to move around the library without going in directly into the smaller reading rooms and disturbing people and so that gives us this uh, plan grid where you get the, the, in, in the sort of beige color, the, the, the 4.7 meter square reading rooms separated by passageways um, and the gray zones are where the bookshelves are held and the external walls and where these passageways, the white spaces cross, you get this green point, which uh, the kind of node within, within uh, the, the, the organization of the plan. And that became, became a focal point for thinking about how we hold the building up, where all the structure is, which Simon's going to talk about. Uh, and also how we move air around the building. So this is our kind of basic scheme, the 4.7 meter square room and next to it a passageway. And then we have a lot of fun with kind of playing around with that organization to create different spaces within the building and to create kind of diagonal and other, other ways of looking through the spaces to create a kind of visually permeable library space. And at the node points, I know Simon's going to talk about this in more detail, we bring the load of the lanterns and the floors down at the, at the corners of our square rooms uh, and because we want to pass through those uh, spaces because they they are the crossing points of our passageways we came up with this scheme of of uh, four separate columns and allow which allows you to get in between the structure at the corners of the rooms and then where then the structure which is uh, the, the main structure of the building being a timber floor construction and a vertical load bearing masonry construction. We sort of bring that all together at these node points and um, show it off. And we create this thing we call the hashtag, which is a sort of knot or knot of, of structure. And as the, as the brick piers come rise up through the building, supporting the load to the floor and the roof, they get to the top and then they become a chimney. And that enables us to, um, to exhaust hot air through the top of the building and it takes part of the, of, the, of the natural ventilation of the building. So we draw air in, cool air in through the facades at the lower levels, and then we let it out through the roof level, through the chimneys, and also through vents in the, in the pitched roofs. Here you see some of the chimneys on the outside of the building under construction. And so then this is our sort of basic arrangement of the building. It's 12 volumes with their lantern roof lights on top sort of set apart by 11 chimneys um, and you see the stepping of the back of the building that accommodated um, a, a large sycamore tree on the site 
and it gives the building one long elevation which faces the uh, the fellows garden the space space we saw the site at the beginning and a shorter elevation which faces the master's garden uh, which meant the master's garden was a bit less overlooked and in talking to the college of and historic england about building this new building in, in a in a very sensitive uh, location uh, right next to the grade one listed peeps building protected open space and so on um, we try to link our ideas about the, the, the organization of the of the volumes of the building um, back to things that they would find as sort of references that would sit well with the rest of the college buildings and we talked in particular about this image you see at the top here of Moynes Park in Essex this is a Jacobean building but um, what we talked about was the way in which the building uses gables and, and chimneys and bay windows to create a kind of rhythm, which is very, very enjoyable. And we said we tried to create a new building um, using those elements. We wanted to use bay windows because we wanted to kind of project the, 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 the reader out into the garden space. And we looked at this, this another project by Lou Kahn. Um, this is the Escherich House. And the, this, this idea of a kind of fixed bay window with a shutter opening on outside of it, which allows you to ventilate the space without draft blowing your papers off your desk. Um, we used previously very much like that window arrangement. This is a project for Jesus College, which was which we built with the same construction team as at Maudlin. So we tested some of the construction ideas there. This is um, mostly in oak, this construction. And so this is the, the sort of typical bay of, uh, of the Maudlin facade. And you see at the base, a French window, which illuminates the, um, the, the gallery space along the along the bottom of the building above that you get a smaller reading room which has a central fixed window and a pair of opening shutters and then above that you get the the, the wider four bays of, of glaze glazing which illuminate the long reading room at the top of the building and above, finally on top you get the, the, the triangular glazed gables of the roof and sitting between those you get you get our, our, our brick chimneys so just to, I'll, I'm now just going to take you on a quick tour through the building so you understand how it's laid out inside. This is just a cross section through the building. On the on the left is the master's garden. On the right, uh, slightly lower down, is the fellows' garden. The building's effectively replacing the old garden wall on the left hand side, and it's a three story library. And a lot of the conversations with the college um, uh, at at the early design stage were about how we would connect. The different floors of the library because on the ground floor as you'll see in a moment there's not very much library and because it's taken over with other things and so what we tried to do was create a very permeable section and plan which would allow this sense of connectivity and um so there are a couple of diagrams here and what one of the, one of the ways in which we try to create this connectivity is through a kind of diagonal movement through the building um which is uh, which is generated by a series of voids that we cut within our kind of regular plan grid um, at making larger spaces that are linked by accommodation stairs. So this is a ground floor plan. Um, you come in in the middle on the left hand side in the entrance lobby straight ahead of you is an archive facility uh, where the college's archive is stored and a, and a room for study of that. At the bottom of the page, long, long space is a picture gallery, and that, that together with a social area adjacent to it can be flexibly used for events. And at the top, if you turn left off the entrance lobby, you get into the to the to the base of the library, there's the librarian's office, and there's a square, one square bay of reading room, um, which is the sort of the beginning of the library. So you can see in that plan there's not that much library on the ground floor. And so our, at, as you enter the, to the library space, you, you arrive in this space, which is a three-story high void with desks around it on, on three sides and a reading space at the base of it. Uh, and at the corner at the back of that image, there's a staircase which meanders off it uh, going up to the first floor and sort of behind us is the, um, uh, is the librarian's office. And as you go up that staircase, you arrive at one of, the, one of these two sets of of bay windows that should stick out of the corners of, 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 of the building at the back as it steps uh, around the, the sycamore tree. And then this is the first floor plan. And so we've arrived, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you, we've arrived um, at one of these projecting bays and you arrive at the end, at the northern end, 
of, of a, a long central reading room, which is a two story space, and then the smaller reading spaces um, and book stacks are arranged around that main central reading room. And that's the main central reading room as you see it arriving at the northern end. And you look back along that space towards a window, and you see the big yew tree which separates the building from the peeps. And then going up to another stair, and sort of diagonally across the plan, um, you arrive up onto the uh, second floor. And the second floor, you've got the tops of the two, two the, the, the three-story and the two-story void, the desks around them. And then on the bottom of the plan there, you see this long reading room, which looks out uh, toward, toward the, the, the fellow's garden and the river beyond. So this is you looking down that long reading room with the bay windows on the right-hand side in that image. And here we are back in the garden, looking back at the building and you can see that long, that's the long elevation of the building uh, with its bay windows and on the, the, the sort of shorter elevation facing the Peeps building, which contains the entrance, this big yew tree. So enough of me, I'm, I'm going to hand over on this slide of a flying lantern to Simon, who's going to talk about the structural design. Thank you, Tim. Uh, okay. Oops, just bear with me. Um, so yeah, structural engineering uh, and and the process of uh, for the new library. I'm going to run through sort of three areas: the um, design development, as as Tim said, there was a lot of collaboration um, on the project to get to where we got to, and then how we move from design development to detailed design, and then a few uh, images of construction to finish off. Um, so design development, uh, RIBA stage two and three, you can see we worked um, on lots and lots of different ideas. There's a few sketches of mine that we, um, how I communicated with the team, uh, we sort of exchanging ideas. And um, and that that really is a sort of um, a small part of what is a very complex project. I mean, this is a, a very quick insight into my brain and, and how I, I look at projects and in red here are the bits that are the timber, what we're here to talk about today, but there is a multitude of other things that you need to think about or um, from construction logistics and all sorts of stuff. Um, but anyway, let's let's talk about timber. Um, so uh, you, you saw some of the early concept sketches uh, from Tim. Um, on the left, you have this sort of first interpretation of a, of a sort of simple single span timber structure into a series of spine walls. And as the design discussions developed with them, um, with the team and the idea of the natural ventilation, that, that became more a sort of a, a series of, of cells or blocks rather than three sort of linear um, spaces. And you can see we've changed to a more two-way spanning primary and secondary beam structure. And um, and as Tim said, it uh, it was an architectural competition and, and which, which Neil McLaughlin's won and uh, very much an influence with brick and, and timber structures or, or, or or features in the building uh, and the structure very much was the was form the architecture in some respects um there's there's nowhere for the structure to hide on this project um uh, but that mixing of materials um structural materials provided some interesting technical challenges from sort of differential movement of materials fabrication and installation tolerances um and that mixing of materials also provided um, some interesting logistics challenges in um, multiple packages, trade packages having to stop and start as they build. Um, and that process of stop start, you know, gives us some interesting uh, uh, thought processes and challenges on moisture control of timber during construction. So um, as you can imagine, that discussion was very long. Uh, we did consult um, quite a lot with the industry uh, early on and got lots of different opinions. And um, we even, um, uh, you know, dabbled in in trying to mix precast brick clad concrete with them um, with timber, um, and one of the reasons for doing so was was this sort of uh, differential movement issue and and the fact that actually concrete and timber were working quite well there, especially when you started looking at balloon frame construction. Um, you know, trying to really um, when we when we're putting timber very close to concrete or brickwork you know we have to worry about how much movement there is so that was a a quick uh, uh, um, uh, contemplation it didn't last very long because uh, it's it, uh, it wouldn't have worked for a number of reasons on the project anyway but we we um 
we ended up sort of, as I say, focusing on, um, you know, load bearing uh, brickwork structure, uh, CLT floor deck um, with originally actually oak uh, glue lamb structures uh, and beams and primary beams were having to be flitched because of the floor loading and the deflection. Um, but along the way that that changed to spruce primarily I think driven perhaps by cost um, but actually there was an interesting discussion around how a CLT floor slab and oak uh, glue and beams would, would would fit together in terms of visually um, and then we had a quite a large element of precast concrete in terms of lintels and ring beams and precast stairs so there was a real mix of different materials and and um Ultimately, the building sat on a facade that was 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 almost traditional house building construction, a traditional cavity wall construction, uh, 100 uh, brick and 100 internal brick. So, yeah, really, really quite sort of, um, yeah, traditional methods of construction. I mean, those sketches also, the devils in the detail, uh, working out how all of those things fit together. This is the building corner details at the top of the building at the roof and, and, and the building gable details. Um, We've got some flitch beams in there and if you can just about spot there's a precast uh, sort of what I call boot lintel ring beam going around the whole building remember that because then there might be something coming up about that later on and then um, I can't use Revit so I do everything in sketching um, so here's, here's the hashtag lintel centrally so this is internal chimney there's me trying to get all of those things to marry and you can just about see the roof perches, per perching perching is that the right word on the internal l-shaped uh, columns which are reinforced because they're helping stabilize the building bizarrely and then even at the perimeter chimneys some some more balancing act going on with some uh, big bits of roof coming down and sitting on an internal leaf of a cavity wall uh, and there's some exclamation two exclamation marks there on my sketch making the architect understand how hard i was working for them to make it all fit together um anyway so that's an insight into how uh, we swap information with um architects and other members of the design team and then we moved to detailed design um, this project had uh, three GAs for every floor level uh, which is quite interesting so you have a, a CLT slab and, and beam arrangement you then have um, what's holding that up in terms of a load bearing masonry arrangement and then sort of sandwiched in between those two you have a lintel and um, beam arrangement as well for each level so you end up with quite a few GAs on this project and an awful lot of um, uh, what they call them, detail drawings. Um, we had a two-stage tender um, and Neuer Holtzbau and Urban uh, working collaboratively were appointed by Cox, said she was the main contractor and they brought in some quite handy and useful and timely innovations to the project, their expert knowledge and Neuer Holtzbau's patented GSE connection uh, or, or details and costs and logistics really helped um, bring things to, to, to site. Um, and um, one of the um, big impacts was bringing, being able to bring in GL34H spruce glue lamb it's in, in lieu of um, the flitch beams that we were looking at, uh, changing that uh, precast boot lintel into a glue lamb uh, sort of boot lintel ring beam around the building and the CLT folded plate roof pods, that striking image that sh uh, Tim showed, that was an innovation brought by Urban and Neuer Holtzbaum about building them on the ground and then lifting them in. Um, uh, that's how we do for time okay and then um, looking at the low library loading and that's where um, this change from flitch to, 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 the, to the spruce uh, GL34 looking at the different load cases and the long-term loadings and because the book stacks were quite a main part of this loading uh, making sure that we we got a, a count of the creep loading which accounted for something like nearly 30% of the, the final long-term loads. Um, so some quite detailed discussions with the library and the architects and everybody on deflections and things uh, were required. Here you can see the general floor arrangement. So we've got the one, two, three, four, five internal chimneys and then the perimeter chimneys around. As I say, they were L-shaped chimneys that you could walk through. And then we have the primary beams running through the page and then the secondaries within. And then we have a mimicking of these beams through here with the hashtags internally. Um, here's uh, the GA showing the, um, the brick layouts. Um, had 17 Newton handmade bricks in M4 mortar. And then we also mixed in some standard bricks, 20 Newton bricks um, uh, around the perimeter where they were covered with um, book stacks.
and the lintel uh, layout, the precast lintel layout. Lots and lots of detailed drawings, as I said, internal chimneys, which are also acting as uh, smoke venting. Um, and in fact, here, the, 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 the masonry runs all the way through a bit like what I would call balloon frame construction. The timber doesn't interrupt that load path as such. Um, um, but but the timber does interrupt interrupt the low path through the perimeter chimneys, and that's where you know Urban and Neuer Holtzbau brought in these um, these uh, details with uh, sort of reinforced bearings that allowed low paths to run through the timber because of the really um, small amount of area we had to land structure on 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 brickwork. It's all very very delicate. Um, bit of uh, engineering and architecture and construction I should say and then um, and then again the balancing lots of balancing going on today uh, the balancing of the roof uh, pods uh, on top of those um, on top of those um, uh, those cells uh, with these steel shoes um, lots and lots of thoughts going in there uh, thinking and, and Urban were key in unlocking some of those um, options and details uh, working with them in the construction stage um the whole timber floor plates were diaphragms and locked into the um locked into the brickwork but uh, xy locked z direction allowed to move so the building was allowed to breathe if that makes sense um and you can see some of the sliding joint details here and here we go the um the the, the, the strange glue lamb uh lintel boot lintels some nice construction shots uh, i think this picture is my favorite showing the the um, in construction of the reinforced L-shaped brick piers. Some really, really, uh, so um, Neue Holzbau and Urban hosted us out in Switzerland and uh, really, really fun walking around the factory. Um, I think these are somebody else's photos, but so you can see all the details. And this is a an enhanced steel bearing to allow us to just about sit this glue lamb beam on a bit of concrete internally underneath one of the chimneys. So it's an, a reinforced bearing. and some hidden secondary beam bearings that sit on a primary. Here we go, some more construction shots. Um, that's at ground floor, that's the ground floor. No, that's at first floor, sorry. Sorry, that's at first floor. And you can see the underside of the, of the timber structure. Some more pictures. And then the tolerances that um, Cox, Edge and Urban achieved on site were, were quite phenomenal. Um, really fantastic bit of work. And um, here's a nice shot showing these stress skin uh, pyramids or roofs, hipped roofs sitting on these steel shoes. And I'm going to finish today on some steel work, which is probably wrong to finish on. But there you go. Those are those little shoes that were fabricated. So um, I'm going to hand over now to Hannes um, and stop sharing. Hannes, over to you. Um, thank you, Simon. Um, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tabitha. Um, thank you, um, Timber Development UK. Um, so yeah, it's it's, well, it's, it's it, yeah a big thank you to actually to to all of you and especially you know uh, McLaughlin Architects and Smith and Warburg to actually put us forward um, to join this discussion. Um, let me share the screen. Okay, I hope you can see this. Um, so what I'm going to focus on in my, my presentation is essentially give, give the audience feedback um, from a specialist designer's perspective. So we as urban and our specialist engineers focus on timber, but we supply the material and we actually install um, the material on site as well. So before we actually, before I'll go into, in, in, into, into the topics, um, I just want to briefly explain how we actually came um, uh, uh, became involved in the in the project. Um, Simon um, already mentioned Noah Holzbar as one of the specialist um, suppliers. So Coxedge, the main contractor responsible for the actual build, um, had a working relationship with Noah Holzbar already. Noah Holzbar is based in Switzerland. Um, and we know each other. We have been working with them um, on many occasions, and, and, and they are trusted partner. And that is basically that is mutual. Um, so initially, the inquiry actually came to Neue Holzbau, um, but because they are based in Switzerland, um, they approached us. Well, are you interested? Can we actually join our forces here, and you 
um, coordinate the design with the design team, you manage the site, you're more familiar with the UK legislation, how the design process work in the UK. Um, so this is essentially how we uh, were brought on board, but it kind of illustrates, you know, the, um, the fact that, you know, we are seen as a, a keen um, as key partners in the uh, when it comes to the specialist manufacturers, um, and there's an integral part we are playing here for the realization of of the, of the product. Um, so, moving on into the actual um, project, um, really, I think what, what what Tim and Simon already kind of um, yeah try to emphasize is you need a team, you need collaboration, you actually need to pull in the same direction from the design throughout um, uh, the um, execution. But what you also need is essentially a main contractor um, who understands the program, who facilitates the different trades, who understands the installation process and, and, the, and the sequence. So, so here again is a credit to Cox to actually manage to achieve the, the level of accuracy because in a sense our package was timber it's precisely cut to the two millimeter but we were interfacing obviously with um with brickwork masonry um concrete steel um concrete lintel precast concrete lintels um etc um so really it's it's, it's the collaboration between between all, all parties um, so what this slide shows here is essentially um, it's three phases. Um, so we um, we came on board in, in, the, in the first first phase, which was a rather small area, ground floor, um, glue lamp beams and, and CLT decks. We then had to essentially demo, demobilize for for the main protractor to build up the next level. Again, the same sequence: um, uh, glue lamp um, beams and decks, and then again a period for uh, the masonry to get built up to level to then install the last the last element um, which is essentially the roof lanterns and the roof the roof decks um, I loved I love to see actually Simon Simon's um, collection of, of, of sketches and it kind of you know it kind of is shown here as well and shows and, and, and shows the intricacies of those of those details and the various interfaces. I mean, there's undeniable, there's a strong sense of materiality, which was required by the client and was obviously you know, emphasized by the McLaughlin architects. So we have a handmade brickwork, we have a reconstituted stone, we have concrete glue down, CLT and steel. We have these various very complex interfaces which had to be coordinated, obviously, from our perspective, from a timber perspective, but obviously, I mean, Martin Glocken would have done a mammoth job to actually coordinate that with other services, glazing manufacturers, furniture makers, etc. Um, so it really, really, it's about um, uh, it's about in, in a way, it's 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 a celebration. It's a celebration of craftsmanship um, that combines the traditional and modern methods of construction in this um, in this in, the, in this project. Um, design coordination. I kind of um, touched on it. I kind of touched on it a, a, a little bit. Um, so really, um, really, what we will be doing here is essentially we are following the. Well, there needs to be um, a, a, a process in place um, to actually get to the point where everything can be fully coordinated and signed off. Because obviously, we as as, as timber engineers, we have. Um, we have lead-in times that we essentially our pro, um, package gets signed off um, sometimes before you know, before the foundation is even in, even in place. Um, so again, Norma Lachlan and, and and the team has done um, yeah a mum's job to actually get all these different different um, trades and special consultants on board to then achieve um, the design. So this kind of axonometric here. Um, on the bottom right, kind of exemplifies all these different different interfaces. Um, moving on, um, I want to actually, you know, touch on this. Um, yeah, one of one of the most most complex details uh, is is the, is the steel tree um, itself. And and I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a kind of a simple piece of piece of steel, but actually, it's working working so so hard. 
um, Smith and Warwick came up with the idea to, you know, use this these steel shoes as as a ring beam as a support for the lantern. The lantern panels, the CLT panels, um, slot into 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 position. You see on the sketch on the left hand side, you know, the kind of level of detail, um, commentary back and forth. How do we make this work from a structural perspective? How do we make it work? How do we fabricate it? And then how do we integrate all the you know, architectural um, considerations we need to uh, which which feed in, whether that's visually or hidden connections, hidden services. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this photo again, which uh, Simon we showed, and this is just an example. That little stiffener plate is essentially we we introduce slotted holes in here to run all the cable cables within within that zone. Um, so coming on to assembly, so that's kind of um, our, our 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 bread and bread and bread and butter in a way. Um, but we are well, we see that holistically. And particularly for this, for this, for this project, I mean, has been has been challenging in terms of, yeah, um, delivering the aesthetics, um, but then, um, uh, excuse me, sorry, um, but then essentially working work, working with with a tr more traditional um, form of building, i.e., brick laying, but then modern method of precisely cut CLT. Um, panels. So again, it's the meticulous planning we have to carry out or consider for the installation, um, which informed the design. So both go actually hand in hand um, for the for the for the offsite manufacture, the design, and then the fabrication and the install. Um, so just to give 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 the audience a, a scale of a scale of sense um, or sense of scale, um, we had um, six timber lorries, ar ar Arctic lorries. So the massive volume of, of timber that actually was shipped from Switzerland, Central Europe to, um, to Cambridge. Um, so what that actually, but we only had one tower crane. So this, you know, the different trades actually had to be, had to, had to be sequenced as well um, to, to, to actually make use, efficient use of the crane. And there's actually no, no fight over access who, who can have the crane and can't have the, have the crane. So again, it's, it's credit to, um, to a Saudi main contractor to take all these considerations um, into, into account. Um, installation um, is very complex, but then at the end of the day, it's actually then quite quite straightforward. Brickwork gets gets built up, um, the pre um, precast lintels were installed, our glue lamp beams were fitted on top, the CLT decks over, and then all safely secured. Um, so uh, and 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 again, is uh, the um, the. Or what Simon already point, pointed out, um, the expert knowledge from our husband, in particular when it came to the um, to the glue lamp beams, um, has been um, a fantastic um, added benefit for the delivery and install of the components on site for speed and quality of the actual um, works. Um, so, so as I said um, before, is like you know these considerations, design and install, go actually hand in hand. And then, and the reason why I'm showing this this particular example here, um, on the left hand side we see a Nine McLaughlin's um, detail for for the roof lantern with the roof overhang alongside um, our kind of yeah simplified simplified version of the CLT panel. So really, what what was challenging here is essentially you see. The main, the main frame of the lantern, where you see another CLT um, panel on top, which forms the overhang. But sandwiched in between, you have a waterproof membrane. You have insulation. So very challenging from a from a from a logistics perspective. How do you actually install it? And what we need to bear in mind as well: this is the top floor, very high level. We have massive drops down down in the building because this is still very much a construction. Um, so there are health and safety considerations, etc. Um, so we met early on with the um, with the with the roof with the roof first. Is that okay? But how can we make this work? Um, and essentially, simply by talking to them and understanding, as like, what are your needs? What are our needs? We actually came up with a solution. Well, how about we actually erect those lanterns on the ground? And how about we have two jigs? Two jigs. We build we build one mainframe, 
you then take over, do whatever you need to do with the membranes and insulation. We then take, take over again and fit, fit the roof panels and then lift the whole, whole thing in place. So it's then essentially the timing, the timing and the coordination between these different trades who sometimes don't actually talk to each other because it's very much sequential, um, which really has reaped the benefits for this for this for this product and it goes to show what you need to do is bring bring the specialists around the around the table and here's the hint the early engagement of the specialist um i want to i, I want to finish with this beautiful beautiful image here because it is, it is when i prepared those slides um it just reminded me it's like how much effort and effort dedication went into this into this project um so in the, in the truest sense this is what collaboration is about and, and delivering an architectural vision that everyone can be proud of. Thank you. Handing over to Tabitha. Thank you, Hannes. And um, Fernando, can I ask you to join us? Ah, there you are. So I think, oh, absolutely amazing. Um, you know, stunning building, which you can tell that you're still, you know, thoroughly enjoyed and, and so much in love with. I mean, it's such a hybrid building. Uh, which I don't think many of us who saw it as the winner of the Wood Awards actually understood. Um, and, and obviously timber and masonry have such different proper properties along with um, concrete. Um, but maybe Fernando, can I ask you in a way, uh, what challenges, where did you come in and what challenges did you face understanding those three materials? Um, and how did you work with the team to solve them? Yes, uh, thank you for the question and yeah, really, really glad to have been involved with this project. And that is, uh, I think some people have asked the question also in the, in the chat, that is um, very much a, a design a design factor and we had to work not only with the, the experts on the design team, but also with the experts from, from different industries. Uh, for example, we worked very closely with the Brick Development Association to, and with the Brick Manufacturer, this were handmade bricks from York uh, that were installed on this on this project to, to satisfy um the, yeah, the closer that this building is, is built into so we had to dig deep into into understanding the moisture irreversible moisture movements of different materials and, and different rinkets and and uh, make sure that all the junctions and all the details uh, were um carefully conceived and uh, even even to the point that it, some of the detailed design of the timber connections had to uh, satisfy the, those those uh, shrinkage uh, criteria uh, using special steel um, gluing rods, as as Hans and, and Simon have shown in their details. So yeah, pretty much a wide range of of um, experts had to be involved in this in this building. Thank you, Fernando, and and Tim, coming to you, obviously. Um, a really complex and, and, and such a beautiful, you know, design and concept. How, how did you work with the rest of the team so, so that with understanding all these materials, you probably don't hold all that knowledge? I mean, how, how do you communicate what you want and how do you get from your team what you need to know? I mean, I think that we, so one thing we didn't really say was that we, when we started this project, we had a kind of vision for the interior, quite, which is quite strong, uh, of a, a sort of a fully timber interior, which the college bought into. But we actually unpicked the whole the whole competition design, which was just us. We did that in a kind of design bubble. Um, but we really started from scratch when the rest of the team were appointed, and um, and built the thing up bit by bit. And so all of these ideas about kind of the room with the with 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 the, with the piers at the corners with the kind of node which then takes all the load and how that becomes a chimney and this all of this just came through dialogue with with simon and and um uh and, and we're also and his team and also with with the mechanical engineers and max Borden. um so yeah we, we just a lot of this just sitting around the table trying to work out how we solve the kind of complicated problems we set for ourselves <laughs> And so, probably Simon. So, when did you you come into the process? So, if, if Niall McLaughlin won the bid, how did you? Where, where did you come in? And then, how did you start working? Um, sorry, Tabitha. That well, that was for me. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm, I'm answering. I'm doing some Q and A answers in the box there, and I can't do two things at once. Yeah. Sorry. So, so yeah. So, um, uh, Tim and his team won the project, and then there was a sort of uh, uh, not a competition, but there was a number of engineers interviewed, um, and yeah, we put our best foot forward, and we're lucky enough to be appointed. And then, and then from that, you saw um, it was quite a, quite a quick process of 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 you know um uh, interdisciplinary dis discussions you know max fordham who were the ME engineers they were quite involved as well with you know the structure and and the chimneys in particular the nap venting solutions and the smoke venting um was quite important um and the other thing not really timber related was things like the the archive down in the um in the basement was a box in box mm -hmm. thermally massive construction um which actually uh, disrupted the structural grid at ground floor. So we had to have a transfer over the top of that as well. So there's all sorts of, as I say, that mind map of uh, what's going on in the building. You know, timber was a, a big part of it, but yeah, it, it's lots of things juggling going on. Yeah. I'll stop so answering those questions in the Q&A box because otherwise <laughs> I'll lose track, sorry. Yeah, do, do this. So, yeah, we've, we seem to have everything open. Yeah. Um, so what? So there, there is a question. Actually, well, how, how was the um, what was the procurement method? Two two stage D and B, wasn't it, Tim? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Cox Sedge won the uh, that process, and they bought on. At the, so we did a stage three, and then during stage four, from memory. Yeah, they they bought on specialist subcontractors for us to work with, like um, Urban, which was key, you know, to, to getting everything sorted and um, making sure that all of those different packages to, could come together with the correct tolerances on site, you know, um, and 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 looking in, across the table in the eye, saying, "Can you do this?" You know, <laughs> yeah, there was um, lots of discussions. Yeah, and I think I think we were really fortunate that the whole contracting team really bought into what we designed and, um, and what you know and what the project was 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 aiming at being um in fact when we interviewed contractors there were some some contractors who came and say oh well I wouldn't really want to do it like that can we change it all and um uh but but Cox Edge and their team I think they, they just really decided okay well, that's, that, that looks feasible we can do that and um because as both Simon and Hannah have been saying it sort of it looks like traditional construction on on one level it looks like bricks and brick you know brickwork walls and and timber floors um but at the same time as, as hannah's mentioned it's that sort of combination of modern and construction it's all of the complexities of working with engineered timber and really pushing those two the, the brickwork and the timber technologies thanks tim so hannah's um someone saying you came in at stage four is is that the right place for i mean obviously that was in this building but do you think that's the right place in a you know a, t a timber building if, if it's a really specialized building as this was is that the right stage to bring you in um well, I, I think I think probably 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 no 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 knows the answer. Um, it's um, yeah. I mean, you know, we were what we are specialist designers. We you know encourage the client essentially the client to to, to engage a specialist early on. Um, and I think I think yeah, um, Tim Tim and Simon will be will be very well well aware of this. Essentially, it's it's the diverse pool of knowledge, and especially when it comes. To special specialist areas, and you know, yes, um, I think you know engineers have a good overview um, of you know um, the, you know the various engineering systems. Um, but then, what is obviously quite particular to timber is then the connection design as well, because it's very specific, and obviously it kind of rests on a on, on a broad foundation. Um, uh, which we kind of you know tap tap into into with our with our partners, so um, yeah, we, we always encourage you know to see specialist input, input um, as early as possible. Um, when we came in stage stage four, um, but obviously because um, Simon and, and 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 Tim they all coordinated and found out the the, the the scheme um, to a very high standard. It was easy, easy for us to then essentially develop and fine tune it, and then go into, into the fabrication. Um, yes, the, yeah, the 
I think the, the key to success is early engagement, whether it's timber, it's concrete, um, steel is, yeah, the broad knowledge you need. Thank you, Hannes. So it seems like you've all sort of like worked potentially either worked together before and it was Tim, it's really interesting for you to say that you did something that you'd learned on a previous project you'd you'd brought into this project. So I think a quick question for all of you, what what lessons did you learn about Timber that or or the process that you'll take forward into future projects? So I start with Tim and then go to Simon, Annis and Fernando. Oh, good for that. I've got time to think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Uh, I mean, I think there's a sort of slight perversity about, about this project in a way, because we take what's, you know, uh, Hannes' uh, ability to produce sort of factory-made timber components and put them together very quickly on site. Um, the, the sort of benefits of that are slightly kind of undone by the decision to have vertical masonry structure, which was quite slow to build and horizontal timber structure. And, um, and we did that for a good reason and um, we're happy with the end result, but it generates a huge amount of complexity uh, in the process and uh, probably had some impact on how long it takes to build. And in the scheme of things that was thought okay because the college builds for, for the very long term, you know, their older buildings are 400 years old. So they're thinking quite long-term about the things they're putting up. But, um, and I guess that's a particular set of circumstances in which we were able to do something here, which we might not be able to repeat easily. Um, so that, I think that's the sort of complexities of that decision-making were probably not fully like, understood by, certainly by us as architects when we made them. Oh, tin floors, brick walls, but uh, there was a lot, a lot to it. So I think that's a, that was a good lesson learned. Thanks, Tim. Um, so I guess my my thoughts would be this is a one off building in some respects, as Tim said, you know, you're building around buildings that are hundreds of years old and, and there's questions about embodied carbon and circular economy I've seen. And, you know, the idea is, is that the building, I think the brief was asking for hundreds of years. I don't think it actually specified how many hundreds of years, but uh, design life. <laughs> so um, for me, you know, that meant that we had the ability to indulge a bit in making this work um if that makes sense we felt you felt almost a bit of a weight on your shoulders to make sure that something would would make sure it works um so you know it's not something that you can do every day i don't feel it's not a sort of, um solution but but having said all of that um you know and and i and i guess many people who work in in timber buildings may 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 agree with me or may not but building a building outside like this um throughout the i think it took nearly two years from enabling works all the way through we had to put a temporary works road in everything anyway um i do wonder whether we should start um uh thinking about how we can have sort of like flying factories on site you know to to protect some of these buildings because water management although cox edge did very well was a challenge yeah so um yeah that that's it's a few words there Thanks, Simon. So you mean like flying coverings, not flying yeah. factories, as opposed to, well, uh, yeah. Hannes did, did bring in flying factories, you know, yeah. <laughs> building on site. But uh, yeah, so you're talking about with moisture management, covering the buildings so that they don't get too wet during the construction process, especially mm. if it takes sort of two years. Yeah, I mean, we didn't cover up much of the timber here, so it's, it's, it can dry out really well. But there are mm. buildings where you do cover up a lot of its stuff with, with finishes and it does struggle to dry out. So, yeah, mm. yeah, mm. yeah. Thank you. Hannes? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, Sam, Sam was making a very good, very good point here. So if you just look at the lanterns, for example, it kind of what was a prime example where we actually managed to reap some of the benefits of this, you know, flying factory, because the lanterns, in essence, by the time they were installed, they already came with a level of protection because the first layer of defence from water was already on but simply because obviously sometimes we, I think at times between the sequence we had two months where obviously the brick would have to go up and that's a manual job, you know, brick is laying brick by brick. So it is really then the consideration, how do we as designers, and I'm looking at Tim, 
but you know, do you know, but at us as well as like, how can we, you know, um, give feedback or can we, what recommendations can we make to, to the architects and the team and the client, how to build, um, build, build a, a project where we don't suddenly need to, need to talk about water damages or, or visual, visual states. Um, fortunately now, um, there are, there are new products on the market. So, so we actually in the forward situation that we can make recommend, recommendations to de-risk um, the water ingress, which we're using on other projects. Simon and Fernando will be aware. Um, so it's the constant kind of research and reaching out to the market and explain to them is like, look, we have an issue here. Can we deal up something? So it's the feedback we need here, direct, which we then need to feed back to the suppliers who have the knowledge. Thank you, Hannes. Fernando. Yeah, I think in terms of highlighting something I learned from the timber industry or the timber in this project, I think I am I would like to draw the attention to the, to the super quality of, of the, the Grulam and the CLT. Not only the aesthetics of, of the of the Grulam the elements used on, on this building, which are selection grade, very unusual to get, but also from the structural performance point of view. There were some questions about circular economy and, and, and timber grown in the UK. Yes, we did consider all of that during during design. As I think as Simon mentioned before, the original design was for fleet beams with steel inside, so we could design with GL24. However, um, thanks to Neue Holzbau and, and, and Urban, they were able to, 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 um, to replace the need for fleet beams or the need for oak with high quality GL34 uh, spruce, uh, which I've never seen before. And this is the first time I see it. And it opened my it opened my mind to the possibilities of, of softwood and and also all the timber species to satisfy both structural challenges and, and architectural uh, requirements of, of exposed uh, structural elements. And that was for me the, the one of the biggest uh, highlights of this project. Thank you, Fernando. Um, yeah, we've got literally so many questions, um, and which obviously we will take these questions and hopefully put them across to our panelists. And if they're able to answer them, then we will, you know, distribute that to to people who are attending the meeting. Because I know we're um, running a little bit over time. We we can have so can we just address two? One is uh, you know, about fire, like what was this fire strategy, and and the second is about sort of ac acoustics. Actually, I, I type already right now, as you were saying, I typed yeah. a response to one of the questions on fire. It was one of the first ones as well. And so, so yes, yes, fire was a, a critical element of design as well. Uh, it was another one. I'm sure it was in the mind map that Simon presented there. Uh, and yet we had to work very closely with the with both the fire, um, the fire specialist, the fire engineer, and uh, the building control. Uh, I think the both both um, were provided by MLM, uh, former MLM, I think they're called now Sueco. And they both provided a useful feedback to the team, and then we had to engineer all the structural elements to satisfy the, the requirements of the of the strategy. For example, we had that archive that Simon was mentioning that needed by client decisions. They wanted to have an archive that lasted for four hours, so we had to engineer. Uh, it wasn't in timber, but uh, we had to engineer those in those those elements. So yeah, fire was a critical element of design. Thank you, Fernando. Shall I just talk a bit about acoustics then? I think. Please, thank um, you. Sir. I mean, it was a key concern of the college uh, and particularly their librarians that, you know, that they wouldn't have a, a, a noisy library because that doesn't work at all. Um, so, I mean, we work with Max Fordham, who's the, the acoustician on this project. And there are two kind of key, I think, things that we did. Um, one is uh, that all of the floor construction, there's a kind of floating floor sitting on top of the CLT slab. Um, which performs a, a dual role. So there's a cavity there, which we run all the services around within um, because we want an exposed CLT soffit. So you have to have all your wiring above and then drop it down um, so that you don't see it on the soffit. So there's a, a cavity for that, which is insulated. And then above that, sitting on elastomer pads, there is a floating timber floor construction a kind of deck, which contains the floor heating and then, and then a timber floor finish on top. So that gives you some impact sound protection between the different floors. And then there's a lot of absorption and it's mostly in the, in the lantern soffits. So you see in the lanterns there's a slatted timber uh, lining to those lanterns and that covers um, uh, mineral insulation with the, the fabric covering and that, that produces a, a really good level of absorption. And in fact, if you go there, you'll find it is quite, it's a fairly quiet library even it has hard floors and hard finishes. 
Thank, thank you. On, on that point, is it actually open to the public? Can you make an appointment to attend? So the, the gallery space on the ground floor uh, is open to the public uh, at various times. I'm, I'm not totally sure how, whether, when, but it's generally you can get in, I think. Um, uh, the library itself is not open to the public. As far as I know, you could perhaps try and make an appointment to see it, but um, it's not generally open because it's a college library. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim, Simon, Hannes, and Fernando. I know we could talk about this for so, so, you know, for such a long time. Um, just so obviously you won the, um, the gold in the Wood Awards in 2021. Um, hopefully, again, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what, what comes forward this year. So entries are open until um, the 1st of July, 2022. And we'd, we'd love you to um, send, send them in. Um, and if you enjoy today, please make sure you sign up for the next design um, timber sessions. And the next building we'll be focusing is on is the Welcome Building on the 8th of June. And um, you sign up you know, via Eventbrite. And I'd just like to say again, a huge thank you to our panelists for giving us our, their time and you know, in-depth information that has not come as far as I'm aware from anywhere else. And thank you for joining us um, today and hopefully we'll see you in June. <laughs>